Hello, <coughs> welcome back. Um, I hope you've all had a uh, exciting first part of the morning. I have. It's been a very interesting conversation, and uh, we're going to continue it now um, with Professor Martin Curley. Well, good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Everybody doing okay? Great. So uh, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, what a beautiful city. Uh, first time ever. Love Cardiff Castle. Made the mistake last night of going to see the second half of Cardiff City versus uh, Brighton. It's a very boring uh, football game. But that's the only, only negative. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about a new paradigm. We've all, we know, I, I'm so thrilled to see the title of this conference, Open Innovation, in there. But open innovation is an old paradigm, and we think the world has moved on, and we talk about open innovation 2.0. That's a little bit cheesy, but open innovation is about an individual company or an individual organization using ideas from outside or using un unused ideas within the company and pushing it out. Open innovation 2.0 is actually a new paradigm, and it's about how we drive massive structural change in different areas of societal systems, in our cities, in transportation, in our energy grids, and in healthcare. So that's a really important uh, paradigm. I'm, I'm going to talk quite a bit about that. We'll talk about digital technologies, our work for Intel. We all witness the changes that are happening and how digital is changing our lives. And I specifically call out health transformation rather than healthcare transformation, because I think actually our paradigm is wrong. I really love the Samsung talk yesterday, the new paradigms. You could, all of them are, are true. And today I'm going to speak to you as, firstly, as an Intel executive, I head our, our, our research. I'm not a healthcare professional. We do a little bit of work in healthcare. Sometimes I'll talk to you as a, as a professor and you'll know, take out the empirical stuff. Other times I'll just talk to you as a citizen of this planet. We're all on this planet for a very short time. And there are some observations and something very important that I've come across recently that seems to have been ignored by the medical profession. And I think it's hugely important. I've probably given 500 keynotes and what I have to say in two minutes is probably the most important thing I've ever said at any conference anywhere in the world, so, so pay attention. We won't get that to that for about 20 minutes. Um, this quote I love, John Cage, American composer, he said, I'm not scared of the new ideas, I'm scared of the old ones. We've seen lots of old ideas that were really bad. In the medical profession, bloodletting. Bloodletting for a long time was seen as, this is wonderful, there were specialist bloodletters that were you know, highly regarded, were well paid, and of course that was uh, found out to be uh, not of value. So I'm really interested as an innovator on new ideas. And the new businesses and the new successes are all built on instinct. Innovators work on instinct. A lot of the medical world actually rightly works based on empirical evidence. But you really hit this sweet spot when you can actually combine instinct and innovation and risk taking with the empirical evidence. So we are arguably hitting this perfect storm in healthcare. We all know about our aging societies. We know about the rising costs. We know the shortage of healthcare workers. And this is becoming a forcing function to you know, force new models of care to emerge. But I think the single biggest modulator on this is the way we think about healthcare. You know, and you can call this, you know, is it the health versus illness paradigm or continuum? Yesterday, the Samsung speaker talked about wellness versus medical. How do we think about health? And where do we invest heavily? So we're going to talk about values a little bit later on. Here's some data. You can see 2 billion over 60 by 2050, 50% 50 increase in healthcare costs, 4.3 million global shortage doctors and nurses. This is if we continue on our current trajectory. And there's a lot of wastage. But what I haven't here, you know, talked about here is actually the number of deaths that are caused by medical uh, and medical mistakes or mis misadventure. Um, there are huge implications. You know, I can't think of another vertical industry that you know, touches as many people on the planet and is, is, is um, you know, of huge importance and personal interest to us all. But I think we have to acknowledge collectively we've made fantastic progress. In the last 40 years, 10 years on average of life expectancy has been added to everybody in the OECD countries. So if you're born today, compared to if you're born 40 years ago, you can expect, instead of 70 years, on average, you can expect to live eight years. This is absolutely phenomenal 
in the history of mankind, we've never seen uh, as much progress in such a short space of time. But of course, we can do even better. It doesn't have to be all that complicated. Perhaps the answers are quite simple. Now I want to talk about this new paradigm, Open Innovation 2.0. So we'll get into innovation for a couple of minutes. We introduced this paradigm actually during the Irish presidency of the EU, and I recognize I'm in the UK, and the EU is not flavor of the month and all that. But this was the Thought Leadership Conference of the Irish presidency of the EU, and we had President Barroso and three commissioners, and some of the top CTOs in the world, you know, from Rolls-Royce, from, you know, McLaren, and from you know, US companies and um, Asian companies, we came together. And I think we were formally able to say, yes, actually, we're witnessing a new paradigm. We think that innovation itself is changing faster than a speeding bullet. And if you think about actually many, many years ago, we had these single cell organisms, then we went to multi-cell organisms, and then probably about 530 million years ago, we had this Cambrian explosion of all sorts of new species. We think the same thing is happening in innovation. You know, we've had a lot of linear, linear innovation, but now when we're able to leverage the collective intelligence, the collaborative intelligence, and collective energy of society worldwide, we can produce some amazing innovations, really, really fast and brilliant innovations. And this is what this new paradigm is about. We have this sort of new prim primordial soup where we have companies working with universities that have kind of much more leaky innovation funnels. Um, we have state organizations. We have actually individuals. These red and green dots actually are individuals that are participating in the innovation process. One of the biggest changes that's happened in the technology industry is the whole app industry. That, app, app, that industry didn't exist 10 years ago. And now it's you know, 20, 30, 40 billion dollars worth with hundreds of thousands of people participating in it. But in the new paradigm of Open Innovation 2.0, one of the key changes is user-led innovation. So the user is no longer a research object. The user actually is an active participant. And I know empowering uh, patients is a key theme of this conference. And seeing the patient as a key innovator and a co-determinant of the outcomes of treatment is hugely important as we think about uh, the healthcare um, uh, paradigm and the new ecosystem. So why would we use Open Innovation 2.0 for healthcare? Well, first, we can get, have better health. We have better health outcomes and lower cost. But we can also drive economic growth. We can generate wealth. We can reduce the impact of healthcare worker shortage. And just to repeat it, the opportunity exists to drive structural change in the way our healthcare systems work today. And we have some small, well, not small examples in the US, the High Tech Act, you know, health information technology for economic and clinical health actually pays and incentivizes um, providers if they adopt and use electronic medical records. Uh, Michael Schreis, who gave the talk yesterday, one of my favorite quotes about innovation comes from Michael said, innovation isn't innovators innovating, it's customers adopting. So the example of the High Tech Act in the US is all about actually incentivizing not only the adoption of electronic medical records, but the usage. And the focus is, the idea is that you can make people more healthy, you can reduce waste, and you can actually create economic growth. So this paradigm of Open Innovation 2.0 is not just about profit, but it's about actually better societal outcomes. Now, we're not making this up. At the, I chair the EU Open Innovation Strategy Policy Group, and over the last four or five years, we've published more than a dozen reports on the state of open innovation. If you go to the OISPG website, you can look at these reports. They span everything from the IP implications of open innovation to the socioeconomic benefit of open innovation 2.0. But based on what we've seen, we can really say, actually, there is a new paradigm. In the past, if you look to my right here, there was a lot of closed innovation. It might have been a brilliant IBM researcher or Bell Lab researcher that came up with the innovation. Henry Chesbro in 2003 wrote the brilliant book on open innovation, the idea that an individual company, we can get some of our best ideas from outside. And Procter & Gamble are the, uh, the poster child of this. When they had a share price collapse, A.G. Laffley, their CEO, came up with a strategy called Connect and Develop. And today, Procter & Gamble will say about 50% of the new product ideas emanate from outside the company. But that's, that's old stuff. The new stuff is this new paradigm that competition is all about the ecosystem. So it's network driven. And you only have to look at mobile phones. Nokia were the giant. But today the winning, the winners are the folks that have the ecosystems. Apple, you know, Google, Android, et cetera. And if you think about an, an ecosystem, 
It's, or I think about the, 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 um, the analogy of linear momentum, mass by velocity. So the ecosystem has the biggest players and the highest velocity will win. Um, I'll give you an example from Intel. I'm responsible for the Intel Labs Europe network. We've been using these principles of open innovation 2.0 and helping invent a paradigm. But four or five years ago, we had about 18 labs in Europe. We had about 800 researchers. Today, we have about 45 labs and about 4,500 uh, researchers. And that's all great. That's no, not a measure of success. But our results have grown you know, dramatically, and that's why we've been able to grow. But the reason we were able to grow is that we're working with the ecosystem. There was a famous HBR paper written, I think, in 2004, called Strategy is Ecology. And it's all about the ecosystem. What we've been able to do in Intel Labs Europe is create a shared vision. We call it Digital Europe, an innovation agenda. And we have about 700 different research partners that are working with us that actually share this common vision. Now, sometimes there's little bits of misalignment. But together, we're able to amplify our own investments. We're able to accelerate and really get a red alliance. So we can work much faster and get a lot more results than if we were just working on our own. So this is just a, an example from my own organization. But to talk about Open Innovation 2.0, and I could probably use all of my talk um, to, to share these characteristics, but we've identified 20 different characteristics or 20 different patterns that we see are common in this new paradigm. And I probably only have time to talk about two of them in a little bit of detail, and I'll sketch a couple of others. So I'm going to talk about shared vision and shared value. This is really simple. It's really obvious, but it's incredibly powerful. But you know, what's often is you know, you know, common sense is not common practice. And I'll talk about exponential technologies. I'll talk briefly about quadruple helix innovation. We've talked a little bit about the ecosystem. But the idea is you, know, you can orchestrate, explicitly orchestrate an ecosystem and manage an ecosystem for, for results. We mentioned briefly user-driven innovation. So let's talk about shared vision, shared value, and shared values. Um, probably the best example of a shared vision was JFK's statement, we're going to put a man on the moon and bring him back safely. And of course, there's a famous story about the janitor at one of the NASA facilities. He was asked, well, what, what's your job? He said, well, I'm working to put a man on the moon. And when you have a group of a community energized around a common vision, where it's about commitment rather than compliance, you can make tremendous progress. And I would argue what's missing in healthcare is that common vision. If we could create and articulate a shared vision, we'd make a lot more progress. Now, shared value, Michael Porter, those of you business schools, so folks who've been to business school will know the Porter Five Forces, and I'll talk briefly about his ideas on, on uh, healthcare reform, and several speakers have already referred to that. But he wrote a nice HBR paper a couple of years ago, Shared Value, the idea that we could re reconceive the intersection of corporate performance and society so we could solve big problems and we could be profitable at the same time. And that really is the opportunity or the prize that is available in, in, in healthcare. Um, as an example at Intel, our vision is that you know, we will try this decade to create and extend computing technology, not just for its sake and to be profitable, but to connect and enrich the lives of everybody on the planet. So it's not just about profit, and believe me, profit is hugely important. You know, you've got to pay the bills, you've got to be able to invest in the future. But there is an opportunity to, to do more. So shared value, and Michael Porter, just to a couple of his quotes, he said, obviously, financial success doesn't necessarily equal patient success. But if they're aligned, actually, there is every opportunity that you could have financial success and patient success aligned. And you know, one of his quotes is, you know, today's 21st century medical technology is delivered with 19th century organization structured management practices and op pricing models. And he talks about a value-based healthcare system. And I subscribe very much to what he says, you know, here, creating competition based on value is a central challenge in healthcare reform. But with one important difference, it's about collaboration, creating collaboration and competition really is the secret to success. So collaboration is, 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 is much more, uh, is going to come much more to the fore. And when we talk about shared value in healthcare, we're talking about well-being, we're talking about welfare, and we're talking about wealth. And I believe, and we believe it's possible to actually achieve those three together. I'll give you some examples. Now, several people talked about the continuum of, health, of healthcare. And, you know, arguably, you know, I've seen sort of, you know, blogs and papers arguing, is the National Health Service, is it a health service or is it a sickness service? 
And when we talk about values, shared values, so what, what's a value? I'll read the definition. Values are important or durable ideals or be, beliefs held by members of a, a culture, community, or, a, or, a, or, a, or a, um, it could be a country, about what is good or bad or desirable. And a couple of questions for us. You know, which do we value more? Do we value health or do we value sickness? I was trying to look for some data for the UK in terms of actually the amount of money that was invested in, in public health and preventive medicine, and then the amount of data that's actually invested in our hospitals and in care and trying to cure illness. I, I really couldn't find the data, but I did you know, come across the Wanless reports, which were written about 10 years ago, and very clear there was a strong deficiency in investing in preventive med medicine and um, you know, to the, in, in, in the wellness. And if you look at where all the money is invested, it's invested to my left here in curing illness. Would you all know the expression, you know, an ounce of cure, uh, an ounce of prevention, etc. So arguably, you know, we're investing in the wrong place. We're all, most of us, thankfully, are blessed with good health. And there's an awful lot we can do to stay on the right side of this. Now, sometimes it's inevitable we have to go to the, to the left here, and then we need the healthcare. But if you look at where the center of gravity of investment is, it's in the wrong place. All the value is over on the right. Business model innovation is required. I love this um, your cartoon. You've probably seen it before. First day of medicine school, preventive medicine kills, return business. Now, it's kind of written sort of, you know, as, as, as a joke, but there is, there is some truth in this. And now I want to divert to actually another area where we've seen telecommunications revolutionized, commu computing revolutionized. But the energy systems in the world, they're kind of a similar place where healthcare is in terms of systems level. And one example, we're working in Ireland with the national grid, the TSO, the DSO, some of the generators, the world's largest heating company, to change the way the energy grid works and the electricity system. In the past, we had just a linear system, big generators and then linear flow to consumers. But we can imagine, in fact, we're already working on this where you and your home actually become a prosumer. You're actually consuming, but sometimes you're generating. And this requires a whole new way of thinking. It could be incredibly disruptive. And naturally, some of the players like the generators, they might say, gosh, this is going to kill us, so we're going to resist this. But what we were able to do is work with the tool Business Model Canvas from Alexander Osterwalder. And we're able to work with all the players who are actually able to create a new business model that works for everybody, where we have shared value for the utility, shared value for the TSO, the DSO, but for the consumer as well. In, in one trial in Dublin using electric vehicles, we saw that um, people that were using this approach, their uh, um, costs for charging electric vehicles were reduced by 44%. And as a consumer, you know, typically if you get a 10 or 12% reduction, you're willing to switch. If you get a 44% reduction, it's a no-brainer. So this is just an example, a real-time example, where there are tools available to actually help reconstruct and build business models that are win-win. Are I want to mention briefly the idea of quadruple helix innovation. And this is where actually academia, government, industry, and citizens come together around the common vision. And one example where we're doing this is with UCL and Imperial. We have a collaborative research institute focused on sustainable cities um, in London. It's working extremely well. We were delighted that we were able to launch this at Downing Street with the Chancellor. We work with the GLA. We work with lots of the boroughs, and I'm going to give some examples later on. And what we see is we're making actually much faster progress than we otherwise would have made if we'd been working on our own. I know Michael Shrey has talked about the network effect. And we're seeing an embryonic network effect in the UK in smart cities, technologies, diffusion through using this approach. Now let's talk about technology disruption. Um, here are five uh, different disruptors that are, you know, that are playing out in front of us and are creating the opportunities for massive change. We have big data. Um, several speakers have uh, spoken about that. We have the cloud. Uh, we have the client continuum and, you know, our mobile phones are more powerful than, you know, the, 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 the computers that um, you know, sent the Apollo missions to the planet and, you know, my phone can act as a torch, it can act as a decibel meter, it's, it's kind of a Swiss army knife. It can act actually as my, my medical device. Uh, security is hugely important and, you know, several speakers have touched on privacy and security. But I'm going to talk briefly about the Internet of Things. I know Michael talked about that. We believe this is fundamentally disruptive. And I want to give you some 
examples that you probably wouldn't expect of how we're using the Internet of Things to talk about what we might be able to do in preventative um, healthcare. Um, just to talk briefly about big data, because it is, is a theme, but a couple of opportunities. Of course, we can um, drive innovation. We can accelerate personalized medical cures using big data. We can create new business models, knowledge-driven entrepreneurship. Um, Commissioner Gagan Quinn, who was a previous research commissioner, uh, I was privileged to be at our hearing when she was um, being grilled by the European MEPs. She said something very fundamental. She said, um, knowledge is the crude oil of the 21st century. And I've co-written a book with a Swedish and Italian professor entitled Knowledge Driven Entrepreneurship. And if you think of all of the major innovations of the 20th century, they came from the flow of electrons and all the big businesses essentially, well, many of the big businesses, wealth was created through actually harnessing the flow of electrons. The 21st century, it's about the flow of knowledge. So you can think of Google, uh, you can think of Twitter, LinkedIn. It's all about the flow of knowledge, and that's where the wealth is coming from and the value. There's also opportunities to enhance public health and safety and increase efficiency. So we know about big data, and it's a big opportunity, and there's been lots of talk about it in this conference, so I'm not going to talk about it too much. I did want to just give this one example and it's amazing. Moore's Law is an incredible phenomena, and we'll, we'll come to that in a second, because I'd like to propose a Moore's Law for the healthcare industry. But recently, over the last number of years, actually, sequencing of, genome, of the genome has gone, actually, is, the cost has plummeted way faster than, than Moore's Law, and this is allowing a shift to precision medicine. And uh, there was a fantastic uh, talk yesterday from the professor in Liverpool around personalized medicine and you know, what's possible and what may be possible in the future. So uh, I'm not going to cover the same ground that he covered. The Internet of Things is, we believe, is the next big thing. It's, we're already witnessing us, witnessing that this. Um, I'm trying to think of the name. It's not Henry Ford, but the current sort of you know, CEO of Ford, he was at Mobile World Congress two years ago. And this is where all the world's telecommunications companies come together. He said something very profound. The car is now part of the network. And in the future, basically, if something has, if you can get a computing portrait, or even if you, ha if you can't, things are going to be connected to the internet. Um, and a lot of the conventional thinking is about, actually, we have these connected things, and that's where the value is. And Michael Porter's written a really nice paper in the Harvard Business Review couple of months ago talking about smart connected things. But he actually misses the point because the value comes from collaboration. If we had an opportunity, I could talk about network science and white collaboration and machine to machine, machine to person, person to person collaboration that's enabled by the Internet of Things is going to drive the huge value creation from the Internet of Things. But that's another talk. What we've seen is that industries that existed for you know many decades, like the book industry, like the music industry, these have been turned on its head by companies like Amazon and Apple. These were significant changes. But they're relatively easy compared to the changes that need to happen in transportation, in energy, in healthcare. We can imagine, actually, a scenario where in 10 years, nobody gets hurt on the roads. We have the technology. We could avoid all collisions. It's all possible. But to drive these massive changes where we have lots of stakeholders, you know, from policy and academic and industry and consumers, the only way we're going to get there is actually we have, if we have a shared vision and are able to align our investments. Now, one of the problems we have in healthcare is that healthcare is a very intensive, information intensive business. This is a study from about four years ago and it shows actually lowest I intensity, IT intensity of difficult vertical industries. I think it's criminal, you know, financial services industries, you know, some businesses are spending 17, 18% of their revenues actually on IT. Whereas, you know, this data shows hospitals and physicians is less than 2%. And this is the most information intensive business. Lots of other data sources as, as well showing that there's problems. But the good news is health IT spending is on the rise. Uh, so people are waking up actually, if we invest in IT, there's an opportunity for transformation. But I'll come, back, come, to second, come to an argument in a second. It's really not how much you spend, but it's how you manage. So there is the possibility to reimagine healthcare. So we can move from, and this is, you know, this is a, you know, the reality of many hospitals uh, still today. Some, some are doing a lot better. But the opportunity to move to something like this on, on the right. And, um, I wanted to ask this question. This is a very interesting slide. You know, does how much you spend on healthcare 
matter, and we're looking at life expectancy at birth as a measure of success. Now, I realize this is a course measure, but you can see an inverse relationship here. The US, which is spending 15.3% of GDP on healthcare, it's got the worst outcomes. Japan is really interesting. It's got the best outcome, 82.1 uh, uh, of an age. And there's something really interesting going on in Japan. The first thing, arguably, is per head of population, Japan has the most amount of scanning scanners and you know, PET scanners and MRIs and CT scanners. It's five or six X what's in the UK or the US per head of population. That's really interesting. But another important there is diet, nutrition. It's hugely important. The Japanese have a very different diet to the one that we have in the West. And I want to come to that in a second. And is nutrition a hugely important determinant of future life expectancy and, and healthcare? So the scenario we see today in many healthcare systems and hospitals is we have some sort of IT strategy, health strategy. We have a budget. We have all these diverse investments that really aren't working together. In fact, some of them are canceling each other out or worse still, having negative impacts, and it's really questionable if we're getting value. So we, we call this, we have low conversion efficiency. Where we need to get to, of course, is where we actually have closed loop control. We have a business strategy or a health strategy that's driving the IT strategy. The IT strategy, we use a dynamic budget portfolio approach. We're able to align our investments and ultimately create a lot more value, you know, through well-being, wealth, and, and welfare. And here we get a high conversion efficiency. But I guess, I guess if you talk to many hospital CIOs, they would say, actually, they don't have this scenario. They're in the prior scenario. So Intel, we've been working with many other companies. Um, about eight years ago, we founded the Innovation Value Institute. And that's based in Maynooth University in Ireland. And what we've been working is to codify the very best IT management practices from companies around the world to actually, how do you manage IT for business value? How do you improve IT capabilities? So players like BNY Mellon, BCG, Chevron, um, BP, many competitors have worked together to pool their knowledge. And we have something called the IT CMF. And many large companies are, are using this to actually improve their IT capabilities and improve them for value. Now, we partners, partnered with HIMSS, and we surveyed about 16 hospitals in the US and Europe. We did a very detailed study looking at um, EMR adoption maturity and what we call ITCMF uh, maturity. And there's a very strong correlation between hospitals that actually had strong IT capabilities. And this is kind of obvious that they would actually have much better um, electric, electronic medical record um, sort of adoption uh, maturities. And you know, the, the R squared was about 0.71, which is, you know, it's, it's pretty good. Um, I think Michael might have talked briefly about IT governance, but what we found is, and again, this, is, this could be the subject of a whole other talk, the most important critical capability in the ITCMF, we've detailed 33 different critical capabilities that an IT organization needs to have in place and be mature to deliver value. But by far the most important determinant of you know, IT capability and EMR um, adoption rates and maturity was IT governance. The R squared is 0.8. And I think Michael might have mentioned yesterday, Peter Reel at MIT Scissors done research that companies that have actually good IT governance get on average 20% better premium returns from their, their IT investments. And a very simple check is if you're able to ask the IT executives and your business executives or administration executives in your organization, do they know what the IT governance arrangements are in your organization? If 80% of them actually know what the governance arrangements are, you're likely to be getting higher returns. Now, Moore's Law is what's driving Intel. It's what's driving a lot of economic growth. Very simple observation that each year, every 18 months, we're able to deliver more transistors at less cost. And what this means that IT is a business resource is the only resource that I know of that's doubling in capability and be delivered at lesser equal cost every 18 months or so. So what I would like to propose, and this original thinking came from a guy called Doug Bush, who was Intel CIO for a while. He's now at um, Care Innovations. The idea we could create a healthcare for, or a Moore's Law for healthcare. And Moore's Law isn't just about Intel. We have the whole ecosystem aligned where it's, you're working with suppliers like ASML, um, material handling suppliers, where we're working together so we can actually 
Moore's Law really isn't a law. It's a competitive challenge. We work together actually to achieve these benefits that we roadmap out. So what if we were able to work out and agree a roadmap, how we were able to deliver dramatic benefits through aligning our investments? And there's lots of opportunities where we can make technology interventions where not only can we reduce the quality of care, or the cost of care, but we can improve the quality of care or the quality of life. Wouldn't that be f fabulous? So, you know, we can move from somebody who's in ICU ultimately to independent healthy living. I want to give one very simple example of how we might be able to do this. This is a hospital, uh, this is an old example we, we, we did at our innovation center in Leakslip in Ireland with a hospital in Alabama. Problem is, the hospital is full, patients are delayed in treatments, they're turning away revenue. Very simple project using RFID display boards where doctors, nurses, patients were instrumented with RFID tags. And here's uh, just a simulation of what happened the bed controllers have much better data around you know, what's going on in the hospital. I'll just speed ahead the simulation here. And your know, bed controllers were provided with simple dashboards, view of what's going on in the hospital. But what were the results? Well, the unit throughput increased by 40%. That's quite staggering. The ward throughput increased by 40% in this pilot. The admission discharge transfer time, the variance reduced by 85%. There was improved uh, patient and staff satisfaction. And actually the returns are very, very good in terms of the 12 months ROI, 151%, 204%, much better than the Bank of England. And this is an example of the shared value. So we can improve outcomes, throughput, and we also got a financial return. So that's a very simple example. But if we're able to line up lots of these examples, we can actually create the design patterns to drive a structural change. But I think actually the value is in, that's, that's real, that's value, but there's much better value if we work in a different space. If we go on to the negative side of this curve, we talk about preventative health. This is where the big opportunity is. And technology can really help here. But more importantly, paradigm is actually what would really help. So we can think about lifestyle, nutrition. I want to talk about nutrition in a minute. We can talk about fitness. I'm going to give some examples on environment where we can do some things with the Internet of Things that really help with preventative health care. Scanning, I mentioned the example of, of Japan monitoring, health literacy. Uh, here in Wales, prudent health care is, is, the, is the policy, and it's all about informing citizens and having them assume a lot more responsibility for their health. And that's fantastic, but we need to educate people more. So not only can we shift left, sort of on the right side of this, or the left side, side of this uh, curve, but we have a real opportunity to reduce the cost of care and improve quality of life if we operate on the, on the right here. So who's heard of the China study? Has anybody heard of the China study? Gosh, I'm shocked. But this is the most important nutritional study, the impact of nutrition on healthcare that's ever been produced. It was a 20 year study from the Chinese Academy of Preventive Medicine, Cornell University and the University of Oxford. And there's a very central hypothesis about animal protein that eliminating consumption of animal protein can help you escape, reduce, or even reverse disease. And it has, this study has been ignored because the money actually is in the big cancer research programs, the big coronary research programs. What if we're looking in the wrong place? This is a 20 year, 20 year study, very, uh, you know, recognized for academics. And Colin Campbell was Cornell. And it's all about the impact of animal protein. And it's largely being ignored. So Professor Campbell might be 100% right. But only if he, even if he's only 20% right, there is a massive opportunity to improve the health of people on this planet. I want to draw your attention to a second book that was published in December 2014. So this is just, it's a very recent book. It's by a G, general practitioner in Dublin, John Kelly. Very courageous man. And he has been using actually a variant of the China diet with his cancer patients, you know, for the last 20 years. And what he has witnessed is actually quite dramatic. Now this isn't a big empirical study with 40,000 patients. It's his individual patients that he's seen over 20 years. The patients that adopted a vegan diet with fish all actually are alive today and all have actually reversed or stopped cancer growth. 
Um, unfortunately, the patients that didn't follow that diet, unfortunately, all had, um, uh, didn't have good outcomes. So this might sound really simple. If it's 100% right, it's fantastic. Even if it's only 20% right, there's huge value. But this, this research is being ignored. And why? Well, I want to use this quote from Schopenhauer about new paradigms. Some of you might be familiar with the quote from uh, Machiavelli um, around how difficult it is to introduce new paradigms. But all truth passes through three stages. First, it's ridiculed. Second, it's violently opposed. And third, it's accepted as being self-evident. Now, I don't know if the hypothesis that Professor Campbell and John Kelly have put forward is correct. But what John Kelly is calling for is detailed empirical analysis to figure out if this is true or not. And what we know in the healthcare industry, it takes a really long time for new paradigms, in fact, new treatments to be diffused. On average, you know, recent research takes 18 or 19 years for a new surgical innovation to be diffused around the world. But let's think about smoking. In 1929, Fritz Lifkind in Germany, he identified there was very likely a link between smoking and lung cancer. And there was a lot of anti-tobacco um, campaigns, you know, driven by the government in Germany around that time. But it took until the 1950s for several British scientists to actually really prove that, yes, smoking does cause lung cancer. How many millions of people died unnecessarily because information that was known and on instinct, you know, wasn't fully empirically validated, was ignored. And it took to 1964 for the US Surgeon General to start to give advice to people to stop smoking. So new paradigms are difficult, but they're really difficult in healthcare. So I believe, and I think this is really important, there potentially is huge amount of value. And I would just put together two research questions, and maybe I'm talking to the wrong audience here, but does consumption of animal protein cause disease? There's a 20-year study that advocates likely yes. There's a much smaller case study based on 20 years of GP practitioner experience that the second hypothesis might work. Does the cons stopping the consumption of animal protein halt cancer growth? Even if these are only 10% correct, there's huge value if we were able to improve or prove these or disprove them. And I think this is hugely important and big data uh, can, can really help here. Uh, three chemists who won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry two years ago, they said, you know, high performance computing was a silent partner um, in winning this Nobel Prize for theoretical chemistry. I think there's a great opportunity for high performance computing and big data to do some accelerated study on this. I think this is hugely important. IoT with smart technology, so I'm going to finish on this. So how might we be able to use Internet of Things and smart city technology to work on preventative healthcare? Um, about a year and a half ago, I had the privilege of, was in the Enfield Borough offices, and Enfield is one of the cities, or the boroughs in London, has a big air quality problem. Um, we talked to a lady called Andrea Clements, and we asked her, well, what problem can you know, Intel help you with using IoT or smart city technology? I was hugely impressed with her answer, but she said, actually, closing the 10-year gap in life expectancy for ladies that live in a poor area compared to a rich area of Enfield is a problem you can help with. This is only a borough of 200,000 people. I know in other areas like Glasgow, it's actually a much wider gap. So we've been working with Enfield and we've been working with other areas to actually figure out how we might be able to help with that. So one of the emerging areas in preventative healthcare and kind of the next spoking problem is air pollution. In the UK, about 28,000 deaths per year are attributed to air pollution. China, it's a lot bigger, you know, 1.2 million premature deaths. But there's also a financial penalty. The EU is fining the UK for about 300 million pounds sterling because um, there's such a, an air quality problem here. And it's, if we look forward, it's actually only going to get worse. This is projected deaths by 2050 if we, if, we, if we do nothing. And this is just from one pollutant, PM10. So what we've been trying to do with our urban IoT services is build an architecture. And we call these the four A's. We acquire data we analyze it, and then we act on it. And then actually we have an API interface, and there's all sorts of apps that can act on this, this urban data. And I want to give you a couple of examples. So to my right here, this is what Enfield uses today, actually, to collect air quality data. For a borough of 200,000 people that has a big air quality problem, they have just three of these machines in the borough. So basically what they do is they measure air quality at three points, 
and then they, they use a simulation model to figure out what might air quality look in the rest of the borough. And it's, essentially, it's a guess. So what we've been doing is actually here on the, uh, just here in the top right-hand corner, we've been creating this Internet of Things device, which basically is about a 50th of the size, is way less costly, we can monitor remote, remotely, and we can distribute across the borough. And this is a disruptive um, innovation, Internet of Things innovation. So now, today, we have about 60 of these deploy devices deployed across Enfield, and together we're getting a much better picture of what air quality looks like in Enfield. And we're starting to figure out, actually, how we can link that to the traffic systems. And by the way, we're creating wealth creation because we've used two UK companies, one in the north, north of England to get new, new air sensors. We've used a company in the south of England, ScienceScope, to actually develop these new devices. So again, this idea of shared value, we're hopefully adding some societal value, but we're also creating wealth and a new ecosystem here in the UK. And what we've built is this living lab in London. So we're in Enfield, we're in Hyde Park, we're in Brixton, we're at Tower Bridge, uh, and we're in Elephant and Castle, we're moving into Manchester, we're working in Peterborough. So we're starting to see this embryonic um, network effect happen. But what we're doing in, in Enfield, our research question is, how can sensor data empower councils and citizens to address air pollution? How can we link these, just first figure out how bad the problem is, you know, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it, and then actually use that to change behavior and look at traffic management. A very interesting project in Brixton, um, about 50% of journeys in London are less than three kilometers. But we've been working with Lambeth Council and some schools, and Nicky Gavros, to actually have children help us design applications that will encourage their parents to walk them to school. So by dis displaying real-time air quality um, information at the school and creating an app that the children help co-design. This is an example of the user-driven innovation where gamification and incentivization, the kids actually get their, the, their parents, encourage the parents to walk them to school and the kids actually then get some benefits if that happens. This is an example of actually preventative health care. That's a small project, but you know the kids get healthier, the adults get healthier because they're walking and you're actually mitigating uh, the air quality problem. Here's another example, small example, Tower Bridge. How can we, um, you know, when the bridge is up, you know, how can we encourage drivers to switch off their engines rather than idle? I know lots of modern cars will actually, you know, will, will automatically do that. But these are the kind of projects. But when you add them up in Elephant and Castle, we're doing some work around a new photocatalytic paint, actually, that will actually scrub and take knocks out of the atmosphere. And what we're doing is these sets of experiments, and on their own, each of them are on their own, they're small, but when you actually add them together, they're very powerful. So this is an example of using Internet of Things to address a preventative healthcare problem and improve air quality monitoring. But it's not going to stop there. We're heading towards the Internet of You, not only the Internet of Things, but the idea of the quantified self. And I could have given you five or six slides of examples of products where the opportunity is for us to be instrumented and we can um, proactively uh, monitor our own healthcare. And this area has moved ahead very fast. It was probably only about eight years ago um, where you know, several, several of the researchers are in an innovation center in, in Leakslip. They created this mode technology that could wirelessly transmit your ECG signal. And at that time, that was considered a real breakthrough. But today, that's almost run of the mill. So there are all sorts of medical devices from this you know, smart sock to you know, the Fraunhofer glucose lactate and cholesterol sensor. We are going to be in a space where we can much better measure and, and figure out actually what's going with ourselves and get sort of early warnings if, if there are problems. But again, the technology helps, but it's all about the paradigm. If we move the center of gravity of our, our, both our, our energy and our investments to the preventative side, I think that's where we'll have the biggest benefits. Now, the, the previous talk from the NHS director was about why is it so hard to change? I want to finish on this. If you think about innovation, there's at least six victor, vectors that need to work in parallel for the benefits to be delivered. First, there has to be a vision. It could be that grand shared vision, or it could be just a simple vision for how we're going to change how a department runs. There's a the technology, and sometimes this can be really hard, and what Intel does is really hard, but very often this is the easiest thing. Then you have to have the business case. Now, when it gets really hard when you're talking about business process change, but even harder when you're talking about organizational change, and way harder when it involves societal change. And the changes that we have to introduce in healthcare actually are a lot about 
societal mindset and societal change. But it's only when we get these six vectors lined up and working together actually to deliver the benefits. Otherwise, we get very inefficient um, delivery of benefits. And I'll come, you back, come back to the core of Open Innovation 2.0, which is all about shared vision. We need a shared vision for healthcare, and it's missing. We don't have a universal one. In, maybe you have in the UK. I'm not aware of it. But globally, in the, in the healthcare industry, I have yet to see a shared vision where we could all work together, like the people in the semiconductor industry do, to actually make sure that Moore's Law is delivered, where we're able to deliver profit and the ability for other industries to deliver great innovation. <clears throat> so some thoughts in terms of some candidates for shared vision, and this isn't a vision because it would need to be a lot more simpler. But what about care networking? If we're able to shift from institutions to preventative, proactive mobile home-based and community care, what if we could provide care anywhere, shift from solo to community and team-based care across organizations and IT systems? And what if we could talk about care customization Leveraging population-based healthcare to person-based prevention and treatment. I think there's some raw material here that could be fashioned for a new vision for healthcare transformation. Um, the opportunity all across the healthcare continuum is for, for IT to help, from the hospital to the home, from medical centers to remote villages, from MRIs to wearables. Wearables is a massive opportunity, and from the device to cloud. So I think there's a great opportunity in front of us but it's not about the technology, it's really about the paradigm. And I think we need collectively to change the paradigm and come together with a shared vision. And if we're able to create that shared vision, I think we can make tremendous progress. So thanks for your attention and hope you have a great rest of the conference.